Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, how on earth did he ride that? Thibaut Nace came of age in the Cyclocross World Cup opener yesterday in a technical masterclass. I'll be looking back at that, wrapping up all the other racing and transfer news and mourning the end of the road season for another year. This week in the world of racing, we learned that the Babadag climb in Turkey is so steep, even the cars have trouble. Oh, <laughs> first gear. The Astana oh. car's gone downhill. That was the Astana Kazakhstan team car briefly going into reverse mode, but thankfully for them, their riders managed to keep moving forwards with Alexei Lutsenko taking the stage win and setting himself up for overall victory too. We also learned that Tibo Nace has arrived and that his skills are off the charts. Thibaut Nace there riding sections of the Waterloo World Cup course that nobody else could en route to the biggest victory of his cyclocross career. Meanwhile, Ellie Isabit was showing skills of a different kind. No, 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 shoe for Isabit. A Formula One level shoe change, if ever I saw one. More on those races later on. Uh, talking though of Formula One level performances, Vittoria Busi regained her world hour record in Aguascalientes last week and in doing so became the first woman to exceed 50 kilometres in the hour. The precise distance was 50.276 kilometres, which is over a kilometre further than Ellen van Dijk. What makes this ride even more impressive is that Vittoria is not even a pro. She's not even a full-time athlete. She's a doctor of pure mathematics and had to crowdfund in order to be able to make her attempt on that record. Congratulations, Vittoria. And finally, we learned that Caleb Ewan is heading back to Jaco Alula after a very public fallout with his current team, Lotto Destiny. It was clear that he was looking for a new home and it turns out he's going back home. I really hope he refines his love for the sport back there because it really feels like that's all he needs to get back to his winning ways. One man that needs no help with winning ways right now is Jasper Philipsen. He won four of the eight stages at the Tour of Turkey last week, bringing his season tally to 19. Two more than the next best world tour rider, Tadej Pogacar. Given that Philipsen only had 65 days of racing this year, it's really quite the strike rate and he's making it look exceptionally easy. Admittedly, it wasn't the best sprinting lineup of the season, but he was in such control on the days that he won, it didn't even look like he had to sprint at 100%. Now, it goes without saying that he also won the points competition at the Tour of Turkey as well. Enjoy your off-season break, Jasper. You definitely deserve it. There was one sprint that he didn't contest, though. The bunch split up early enough on stage five that somebody else had an opportunity, and Nico Dents didn't need a second invitation. It was one of the most impressive rides I've seen in a long time. It looks like he was leading his teammate out from about 1,500 metres to go, but with the technical nature of the course and the power he had in his legs that day, nobody got around him. Not even his teammate, Matt Walls, who finished second. Victor Langolotti of Burgos BH got the better of race leader Lutsenko on stage six, whilst Jay Vine managed to spoil the sprinter's party by holding the peloton at bay on day seven. Uh, Lutsenko and his team defended his race lead through to the end of the race, wrapping up with his ninth win of the season so far, which means he took more than half of his team at Stana's total tally. At the tour of Huangxi, the sprinters have been sharing things out very nicely between them. On the opening day, Aliyah Viviani took his first win at World Tour level in four years for the Ineos Grenadiers. The man he beat, Jonathan Milan, took the spoils one day later. And then it was Dutch delight on stage three. Olaf Koy with his 12th win of the season ahead of Rick Plumers and Marijn van den Berg. They all had a rest on stage four though, the toughest of the race, and we had a surprise victor there. Milan Feder switched from mountain bike to road last year and quickly had a very nasty crash at the Tour of the Basque Country. He fell over a guardrail and was put into induced coma, and his road to recovery has been a long one. So whilst not many people would have predicted his win at Guangxi, it was certainly a deserved and very appreciated one. And he did it in some style. Whilst we anticipated some of the bigger names making their move, Fader made his, and it was decisive. Wellens was immediately in trouble, and not even a last-ditch effort from Remy Rojas could deny the Dutchman his first career win on the road. The penultimate stage of the race concluded this morning, and it was yet another sprinter making their mark. This time, Juan Sebastian Milano took the honours for UAE Team Emirates. The race will conclude tomorrow in what looks like another stage for the sprinters, despite a couple of climbs in the last third of the route. Fader remains the race leader with a six-second advantage over Rojas. 
The Women's Tour of Guangxi one day race is also on tomorrow, but unfortunately there's no live production, so we'll have to wait for the highlights to see that one. Once those races reach their conclusion, we can then draw a line under the 2023 road season, one that's been exceptional, in my opinion. But we're already thinking about 2024, since RCS revealed the complete route of next year's Giro last Friday night. For a full look at it, you can check out our video, which goes through every stage, or indeed globalcyclingnetwork.com, where Patrick Fletcher has written an article about what is a climbing light course next year, at least compared with recent editions. With the first Grand Tour still seven months away though, our attention now turns to track and cyclocross, with the latter having already kicked off at the very highest level. There was only one North American round of the World Cup this year in Waterloo, but it did not disappoint. In the women's race, we had a full start. Not something you see that often in the world of cyclocross, but everybody was called back to the start and seemed to still be in good spirits. Once they'd got going, world champion Femme Van Empel soon pressed the pace, pulling Puck Peterson and Céline Del Carmen Alvarado with her. As ever in cyclocross, it was about making the fewest mistakes, uh, but the first of those mistakes was by Van Empel. Whilst Peterson flew over the planks in typical style, Van Empel had to abort before the second one. However, the shoe was on the other foot soon after, with Peterson coming to grief on the steps and then colliding with Alvarado as she tried to get back to the front. She'd never see it again. Van Empel was never caught and started her World Cup campaign this year in exactly the same way as she did 12 months ago. Peterson was second, bringing her long US trip to an end. Alvarado was third. Magali Rochette took a very credible fourth, with Zoe Bagstedt in fifth. In the men's race, Ellie Isabet was quick to put the hurt on everybody else, but under-23 world champion Pim Ronha was able to stick with him and push him very hard. Thibaut Nace, who'd found himself quite out of position on the opening lap, was eventually able to get himself to the front and strut his stuff. And it was mesmerising to watch him tackle the more technical parts of the course. He rode the steps on pretty much every lap, even when there was a lot of traffic for him to get through. But the decisive point of the race came when Isabet had an issue off camera and was forced to change his shoe. That left the two Trek riders out front, with the Belgian chasing behind. Nace rode the steep banking for the first time midway through the race, getting a gap on his teammate, but I won't say that he never looked back. He was obviously very nervous, as I guess you would be if you're on course for your first World Cup victory, and almost spent more time looking behind him than he did in front. As it turned out, he needn't have worried. He extended his gap over the last couple of laps to take his first elite victory at the World Cup. And it sort of feels like Nate has been around for a long time at this point, but he's still only 20 years old. And that is definitely going to be an enthralling season-long battle for the overall World Cup win. His dad, Sven, who won 50 rounds of the World Cup in his career, was there to embrace him just beyond the finish line. A heartwarming moment, I've got to say. On to what we've got coming up for you this week on GCN Plus. And this is going to be a much shorter section than normal, unfortunately. The Veneto Classic brought the European road season to a close yesterday, and so as mentioned before, all we have left for you is the final day of the men's tour of Guangxi and highlights of the women's. We do, however, have some more cyclocross for you this weekend. This Sunday, it's the first round of the Super Prestige in Overlays of Belgium. Coverage of the women's race starts at 12.30 BST with the men's at 1400, and they're both available to watch everywhere except for Belgium. And it's the start of the UCI Track Champions League. The best track riders in the world are back from the 21st of October to the 11th of November for the third edition of the UCI Track Champions League. Sprinters and endurance riders will thrash it out over multiple rounds in consecutive weekends, with the first stop of the season this coming Saturday evening in Mallorca. There are no territory restrictions at all on those rounds, so all subscribers will be able to watch all the action. On top of that, we have the Triathlon Super League from Neom in Saudi Arabia this coming Saturday. Uh, but for those of you who haven't yet watched it, make sure you catch up with the world of cycling from last week. Our final show of the year and one in which the general public voted for the many awards on offer. And as it's the final show of 2023, we thought we'd make it available for everybody to watch on GCN Plus, even if you're not a subscriber. Uh, let us know what you think and what you'd like to see from that show next year in the comments below. Our documentary this week is called KOM Hunter Mont Ventoux, the bald mountain, the giant of Provence. However you name it, it is one of the most iconic climbs in all of professional cycling. To break the record for the fastest time up that climb is something that most cyclists could only dream about, but that's exactly what EF Education Easy Post sports director Tom Southern and his band of five amateur hill climbers are going to try to do. Uh, the Strava KOM, held by World Tour professional Richard Carapaz, is just over one hour, so to beat it would need a team effort. 
British national hill climb champion Andrew Feather and pro racer Max Steadman spearheaded that team. Will they break the record or just become another victim of the Von 2? Here's a trailer for you. I think Mont Ventoux is a hill that everyone knows if you're a cyclist. It's the most mythical climb of all. It's an imposing mountain. Easy, easy, <laughs> easy. We're here to get a comm and we have to ride at comm pace. We want to try and take Richard Carapaz's KOM. Yeah, let's do this. They're off. Andrew and Max, they're both very, very fast. I'm thankful they're on the same team and hoping there's going to be no Froome Wiggins dynamics. Oh, yeah, he's got his national champs killed. <laughs> Just looking over my shoulder in case Max suddenly comes out with a maximum attack. You never know with him. Someone's going to get an unglamorous job. Are we on the climb? Oh, yeah. Someone's going to get a more glamorous job. It was quite hard to judge the pace. Someone's hopefully going to get a KOM on their Strava. That film is out for all GCN Plus subscribers to watch from tomorrow. Uh, in a wrap-up of the other races from last week, Dorian Godon won an uphill sprint in the Giro del Veneto. And that was his second one-day race win this season, having already won Brabant's appeal back in April. Uh, UAE team Emirates had put all of their eggs into the Mark Hirschi basket, but despite a good lead-out, Hirschi was only able to finish fifth. Tobias Johansson and Florian Vermeer took second and third respectively. Here she went a few places better by coming second at the Veneto Classic yesterday, and it was behind his own teammate Davide Formolo. A couple of weeks ago, he'd never won a one-day pro race, but now he's won two. Uh, the two of them were away with a very strong Filippo Zana of Jaco Alula, but it was always going to be hard for him being outnumbered in the finale. It's a really cracking race, that one. It's got everything you need for a big classic, except perhaps for a date on the calendar. Unfortunately, it's never going to get all the big names attending, when most of them have already been thinking about heading to the beach for a few weeks by that point. Over at the Tour of Chongming, there were a couple of career bests over the first two stages. Milene de Zuta of Seretit WNT took her first ever pro victory on stage one, whilst Hannah Serak took the biggest win of her career on stage two for Li Ning Star Ladies. However, it was the experience of Chiara Consoni that shone through in the end. She picked up a boatload of bonus seconds throughout the final stage and still had the power to finish it off with a stage win and the general classification. Uh, she's now had 14 wins as a pro rider, but that was her first overall win at a stage race. At the Chrono de Nation, Remco Eivindhoor didn't quite have the season ending that he'd hoped for in the rainbow bands. The world champion came up 13 seconds short against the man he'd beaten by 48 seconds at the world championships, Josh Tarling. That, despite Tarling going the wrong way around a roundabout near the finish. For the 19-year-old Brit, it caps off a magnificent debut pro season in which he won a bronze medal at the Worlds, a gold at the Europeans and British Nationals, as well as a maiden World Tour victory at the Renewi Tour in August. If he carries on improving, the other time trial specialists should be very worried if they're not already. In the women's, it was even closer. Just one second separated Anna Kiesenhofer from second place Christina Schweinberger, so a 1-2 for Austria on the day. Uh, just one more piece of race news for you. Uh, some of you will be familiar with the name Jens Decker. He's a former junior world cyclocross champion who retired at a very young age after burning out. More recently, he's commentated for us on some cyclocross and road events, but this year you won't be hearing as much from him, but you might well be seeing him more. Last winter he decided that he was going to make a comeback, and so far, so good. He won a C1 level race in Spain last Thursday, ahead of Spanish champion Felipe Orts, no less. Uh, beat him again two days later at another race in Spain, and then finished runner-up to him yesterday in Portugal. I'm really looking forward to seeing how he gets on in the Northern European races later on this season. In other news, Anta Marche sent two riders home from the Tour of Guangxi before the race had even started. An Instagram story from Kerben Tayson showed Maddis Mikels pulling a slanted eyes racist gesture. Uh, the riders have since both apologised profusely, but the UCI has referred the matter to its disciplinary commission. I will finish, as ever, with the latest contract news. Kristin Faulkner is the latest rider to sign up to EF Education Cannondale. 
Uh, Faulkner spent the last two years with Jaco Alula, taking four big wins in that period. Kevin Collioni is another rider heading away from Jaco. He's been signed up by Antomarche Circus Wanty. Uh, one rider set to move away from that team is former world champion Rui Costa, who recently won the Japan Cup. And according to our website, globalcyclingnetwork.com, he's got a preliminary agreement to join EF Education Easy Post next year. Another veteran who is struggling to find a new home, though, is Edval Bursenhagen. His contract has not been renewed by Total Energies and talks with other teams have so far come to nothing. I do hope he does find a ride for next year. He might not be at the height of his career, but he's certainly one of the nicest riders in the pro peloton. Tim de Klerk has confirmed that he'll be leaving Soudal Quickstep after seven years to join Lidl Trek. The initial contract is for two seasons and there's no doubt he'll continue in his tractor role for the likes of Mass Pedersen and Jonathan Milan at his new team. Alpes and de Koenig have signed up another of the Soudal Quickstep riders in the form of Stan Van Tricht as well as Yuri Holman currently at Movistar. Whilst they've also promoted Luca Vergolito, last year's Wift Academy winner. Uh, he's been with their development team for this year. Mobistar, whose team looked very thin on the ground just a couple of weeks ago, have extended the contract of 12 of their current riders for between one and three years. And lastly, Sherry Pridham moves away from her job as DS at Lotto Destiny to take up a role as head of sport at the Team UAE ADQ women's team. That is all for this week. Thanks as ever for watching. Uh, I'm off next week, so I'll be leaving you in the capable hands of Joe Timms, but goodbye for now.